Mom, look at this! Excitedly shouting, my daughter Isabella held out what she was carrying towards me. My son Alexander and I turned our eyes to the envelope that she was excitedly presenting to us. Upon checking the contents of the envelope, it appeared to be a wedding invitation. We carefully opened the envelope, and the moment we saw the invitation inside, we were struck speechless with surprise and shock. The invitation clearly listed the names my sister Jennifer and Andrew as the senders. My mind and heart were instantly thrown into chaos, frozen in place, unable to comprehend how much time had passed. Jennifer said that she was completely unaware that Andrew used to be my fiancé, but that's hard to believe. She is cunning and calculating. Without a doubt, she must have intentionally stolen Andrew from me. I can understand why you'd suspect me. But, do you have any proof that I stole your fiancé? Haven't you considered that maybe, just maybe, you had some responsibility in being left? Even though we may look similar, unlike you, I decided to invest time in enhancing my charm and polishing my appearance as a woman. It's a perfectly natural choice for a man. That you can't understand such a basic thing is why you were left. That's the reality. Sorry not sorry. After spouting such words, Jennifer ended the call with a mocking laugh. After 20 years, facing Jennifer again, she had transformed into a villainess beyond imagination. She has consistently taken away things that are precious to me. And now, I need to teach Jennifer an important lesson. Constantly taking from others ultimately benefits oneself in no way. In the end, Jennifer will be left with nothing. I hope Jennifer loses everything and ends up completely alone. And that she falls into hell sooner rather than later. I will never forgive her. My name is Charlotte. I'm 48 years old, I will be getting married for the second time in my life. At 25, I married William, my college sweetheart. Our love deepened as we met in college, both aspiring to be teachers. Soon, we were blessed with my daughter Isabella and decided to get married during her pregnancy. Two years into our happy marriage, our son Alexander became a part of our family, and we spent our days living a fulfilling, though ordinary, life. However, three years into our marriage, William suddenly asked for a divorce. The reason he gave was that he had found someone else to love. William didn't disclose who the other person was or when their relationship started. He just kept saying it was his fault, offered to pay alimony and child support, and left our home. William's departure left a deep sorrow in my heart, but if his heart had found new love, I had to accept that fact. Above all, I had my beloved children. Taking his decision seriously, I resolved to move on and start a new life. With the kids still young, I reverted to my maiden name and started anew with them. Twenty years have passed since the divorce, and my daughter Isabella is now 23, having secured the job she wanted. My son Alexander is now a junior in college, and I'm reminded of how quickly time passes by their growth. The days after the divorce were filled with work and dedicating myself to raising my children alone. The child support from William was carefully saved for the children's future college education. When they reached college application age, that savings became incredibly useful, and I found myself grateful to William then. Since the divorce, I haven't seen William at all, and I have no idea about his current life or whereabouts. But that's a distant memory now, as a new family is about to join my life very soon. In fact, I'm getting remarried in six months. The person I'm marrying is someone I met at a networking event for different industries, which I was invited to by a friend. He's three years younger than me, a 45-year-old Andrew with no prior marriage experience. After hitting my 40s, I decided to spend time on things I enjoy, like outdoor activities, fishing, traveling, and immersing myself in my hobbies. Andrew said with a laugh, 
and it was clear he genuinely enjoyed outdoor activities. Despite the cold season, his skin was impressively tanned and healthy. I also love the outdoors and have taken my children camping many times since the divorce. As a family, we've experimented with setting up tarps, testing various types numerous times to find the best one. When I shared my camping experiences with Andrew, he listened intently, his eyes sparkling with interest. Afterwards, the four of us, including Andrew, started going camping together, and now my children have become very close to him. Sitting around the campfire together, I sincerely hope this happy time continues forever. About two years after meeting him, Andrew proposed to me in an unexpected way. You can be strong-willed at times, but that's what I find attractive about you. You're the only one who has shared and enjoyed my hobbies with me. I can't think of a more ideal partner than you. So, I want you to marry me. And Isabella and Alexander, would you become part of my family too? As Andrew spoke to our family with such sincerity, my children replied without hesitation, of course. While I chuckled a bit at his remark about being strong-willed, I wholeheartedly agreed to his proposal, and we all joyfully embraced the moment. We hugged each other, shedding tears of joy, and engraved this special moment in our hearts. At this point, I am 48 years old. I never thought I'd have the chance to remarry at this age, so I've decided to cherish this happiness. I was truly looking forward to the future with our family of four. However, those happy days were about to be disrupted by someone from the past. I have a sister Jennifer, who is 10 years younger than me. Jennifer left home as soon as she graduated high school and hadn't contacted our family for 20 years. Even our parents had no idea where she had been or what she had been doing all this time. I received news from my mother that she had returned home for the first time in 20 years. After leaving home, she seemingly started a new life abroad, having secretly prepared for her overseas studies right after graduating from high school. My mother told me that Jennifer was very surprised to hear that I was getting married. My mother also mentioned that Jennifer would be visiting us soon. I felt nervous about reuniting with Jennifer after 20 years, considering the distance that had existed between us since our childhood. With a 10-year age gap between us, I was at a loss for what we could talk about after such a long time. According to my mother, while Jennifer has matured in appearance, her personality remains unchanged from her youth. The last time my children saw Jennifer, they were three and one years old respectively, so it's almost like they're meeting for the first time. Our sisterly relationship was neither particularly close nor distant, it was just an ordinary sibling relationship. I have a somewhat strong personality, while Jennifer was more of the sweet-natured and pampered type. Although our personalities were quite contrasting, we looked similar. However, having not seen each other for 20 years, those memories have gradually faded. At the time of my first marriage, Jennifer was just 15 and still in high school. My then-husband William was very fond of her, treating her like a real sister and even utilized his teaching credentials to assist her with her entrance exam studies. It's unclear when Jennifer started thinking about studying abroad, but I suspect she made some decisions about her future while I was busy with childcare. If we were to reunite, I'd be interested in hearing about her thoughts and decisions during that time. Jennifer visited my house about a week after my mother contacted me. When we reunited after such a long time, Jennifer sported a curly bob hairstyle, an elegant long dress, a large hat, and sunglasses, a sophisticated look likely influenced by her life abroad. Her fashion style was very refined and luxurious, a stark contrast to my preference for simple hairstyles and denim jeans. It's been a long while, Jennifer. I heard you've been living abroad. You look very well. Are you planning to stay in America for a while? As I spoke, I led Jennifer to the living room and invited her to sit on the comfortable sofa. 
However, Jennifer didn't pay attention to my words and kept looking around the house. Suddenly, she stood up from the sofa, walked over to the window, and gazed outside. I'm surprised to see my sister living in such a nice place. Without changing her expression, Jennifer then headed to the kitchen, where she began to open the pantry and refrigerator on her own. After thoroughly inspecting the kitchen, she started walking towards the bedroom. I hurried to block her way. Wait a minute! Don't look in that room! It's messy with clutter! Despite my attempt to stop her, Jennifer opened the door to the bedroom anyway. Wow, it really is a mess in here. She said, and immediately closed the door. I wanted to prevent her from seeing the children's private spaces, so I pushed her back towards the living room. Even as we sat on the sofa, she continued to scrutinize the room and then murmured softly. This house is really nice. I could want it for myself. The moment Jennifer made such a statement, I froze as if time had stopped. Memories from the distant past vividly returned to my mind. Indeed, Jennifer had always been like that. She was always skilled at attracting affection, showing a keen interest in what I possessed, and desiring everything. Our parents were especially indulgent towards Jennifer, always telling me to give in because I was the older sister. Due to our age difference, I often ended up giving my belongings to her. My cherished toys, my favorite donuts, and my beloved hair accessories. Whenever Jennifer said she wanted something, I could hardly ever refuse. Jennifer, what are you talking about? Giving you the house is obviously out of the question. It was probably the first time I had ever refused such a request from her. This house was the place I planned to live in with my beloved fiancé Andrew. I really liked this house, including its spacious layout and convenient location. When Jennifer reacted to my words, her expression seemed to cloud over for a moment, but she quickly regained her smile. Don't make that face, big sis. I was just joking, a bit envious, that's all. Seeing she shake her shoulders with a light laugh, I sighed with relief inside. Her interest in my possessions was, after all, a story from our childhood. Now at 38, she had grown into a full-fledged adult woman. Afterward, Jennifer shared many interesting stories about her life abroad, the popularity she enjoyed overseas, and how she received support from many men during her studies, never struggling with life. She managed to leverage the connections she made abroad for employment, living there for a while. However, Jennifer decided to return to America when her visa was about to expire. According to her, Jennifer had dated someone with a spacious pool at his house, accustomed to driving luxury cars and dining at high-end restaurants. It seemed somewhat surprising that Jennifer, who led such a lavish lifestyle, would envy my ordinary way of life. What kind of work does the person you're marrying do? He's a corporate employee and heads one of the departments. A department head? And he's still in his 40s? That's really impressive. Being in such a position in an American company means he must be very capable. Jennifer said this with sparkling eyes. Indeed, Andrew had made a rapid career progression despite his relatively young age, and the company he works for is a large corporation. Even Jennifer, who had lived abroad for a long time, was surprised to hear the name of the company. Andrew has been faithfully working for this company for over 20 years since he joined as a new graduate, and his sociable nature and love for outdoor activities have greatly contributed to his career. Unfortunately, Andrew was away on a business trip to a rural area today, so I couldn't introduce him to her. My children were also busy with work and university, so they weren't at home. Then, next time I come, please introduce me to everyone. I'll visit again. As the evening approached that day, Jennifer appeared to have made up her mind to head back home. 
I decided to see her off to the entrance politely. At that moment, Jennifer noticed a small glass stone among the decorations at the entrance. This color is lovely. Can I have this? Without waiting for my response, she slipped the beautiful glass stone into her pocket and quickly left the house. That glass stone was a valuable souvenir to me, chosen and bought by my son Alexander from his school trip. That was something I particularly cherished. I sighed softly and slowly returned to the living room. Jennifer had said she would come again, but she never did visit again. My son Alexander was only one year old at the time and didn't remember Jennifer, and my daughter Isabella's memories of Jennifer were vague. I told my fiancé Andrew about Jennifer's return, and he promised to spend time together the next time she visited. I learned from my mother that Jennifer is currently not employed but goes out every day. Perhaps she is actively job hunting, and I was waiting for some form of contact from her. Two more months went by, leaving just four months until Andrew's and my wedding. Considering our ages, we planned not to have a grand wedding. With Andrew frequently away on business trips and me being busy with work, we had limited time for wedding preparations. However, we planned to hold a small gathering to inform our families and close friends of our new beginning. I consulted with a friend who is now a renowned wedding planner and a former classmate about the wedding. She told me about a trend for smaller weddings with short preparation times and limited guests. Hearing this, I was drawn to the idea of a small wedding that could involve only family. Indeed, marriage doesn't mean everything for happiness, but meeting Andrew was a significant happiness for me. Having him by my side, along with my children, is my most important happiness now. At this moment, I was filled with a deep sense of satisfaction and happiness. Mom, I've finished preparing over here. Let me help with what you're doing. Today was the day of our family's eagerly awaited monthly camping event. Andrew, me, and our children Isabella and Alexander have a tradition of going to a campground somewhere every month. We were looking forward to this day, especially since Andrew had been busy with work and we had less family time than usual, so our anticipation for this camping trip was higher than ever. However, unfortunately, it was raining today, and the wind was blowing strongly. Camping is always subject to weather. A little rain isn't a problem, but strong winds aren't suitable for camping. Especially if the wind causes the tent to sway significantly, there's a risk of pegs coming loose, potentially injuring us or other campers. Safety is our top priority, so we sometimes have to give up on camping when the wind is strong. Due to the strong winds from the morning, we had to give up on our usual outdoor camping and decided to have an indoor camp at home instead. I started preparing the ingredients needed for the barbecue in the kitchen, and Isabella and Alexander set up a makeshift tent in the living room. At night, we planned to spread out sleeping bags in the living room and sleep together as a family. Andrew always says this. The key to outdoor activities is to enjoy them, no matter what the weather is like. Keeping his words in mind, we were busy preparing for our camp at home. But, Andrew hasn't arrived yet. Checking the time, it was already well past 2 p.m. On camping event days, Andrew usually comes to our house in the morning to help with the preparations. More than my children, Andrew seemed to look forward to camping like a kid. However, for some reason, he hadn't shown up even in the afternoon. I was worried whether the bad weather was to blame or if he had encountered some trouble on the way. Attempts to contact him via mobile were unsuccessful due to no signal. Isabella and Alexander, too, were anxious about Andrew's unusual absence. Finally, just after 6 p.m., we received the long-awaited call from Andrew. Sorry for the late contact. Despite feeling relieved to hear his voice, I was concerned by its unusually somber tone. Andrew, where are you? 
Everyone's waiting. You sound a bit down. Is everything okay? If he is unwell, I don't want him to overdo it. Just as I was about to express this concern, Andrew uttered words I could hardly believe. Charlotte, I'm truly sorry. I can no longer marry you. I'm sorry. My world turned blank at his unexpected declaration, unable to grasp what he meant. What happened? Why can't you marry me? My question was echoed by Isabella and Alexander, and Andrew's voice sounded almost like he was crying over the phone. And I can't come today either. I'm really sorry. I tried to ask for more details, but the call ended. Holding the silent smartphone, I sat down, feeling a profound sense of loss as the happiness that filled my heart until moments ago silently crumbled away. Isabella quickly came to sit beside me. Alexander gently stroked my back, and the three of them began to cry together. As the night deepened and the room darkened, we huddled together, mourning in tears. That night, we fell asleep in the small tent set up in the living room, wrapped in sleeping bags, huddled together into a deep sleep. The intense emotions that had overwhelmed me began to slowly subside. I reassured myself that it was okay, because I had Isabella and Alexander by my side. In the morning, I woke up to find Isabella had gotten up early to prepare breakfast for the family. Alexander had also tidied up the house. Mom, it's breakfast time. Let's eat together. Led by Isabella's cheerful and energetic voice, I headed to the dining table. On the table was a colorful salad full of fresh vegetables and a heartwarming corn soup. There were also the dinner rolls bought for the barbecue, Andrew's favorite. The memory caused tears to form in my eyes without me even noticing. Holding the spoon for the soup tightly, tears streamed down my face. The words Andrew had suddenly delivered were still hard to accept as reality. I even wondered if this was all a bad dream. However, witnessing Isabella's tears, I painfully acknowledged that this was indeed reality. Mom, it's okay. We're here for you. We'll be together. Always calm and kind, Alexander's words. Alexander was very close to Andrew, sometimes skipping university lectures to go fishing with him. Alexander surely must have been looking forward to a life spent together with Andrew. Alexander, I'm really sorry. Seeing him shake his head in distress at my apology made me feel terrible. I shouldn't make my son feel this way. I need to be stronger. I need to talk to Andrew and understand what's in his heart. With that resolve, I reached for the breakfast Isabella had carefully prepared wiping away my tears. Days after direct conversations with Andrew became impossible, a lawyer representing him unexpectedly visited our home. We were informed that Andrew did not wish to escalate the situation regarding our broken engagement and proposed a settlement for our family. Moreover, we were directed to conduct any future interactions with Andrew through this lawyer. I understood Andrew's position in a significant role at his company and his desire to avoid scandal. However, I couldn't help but question why he wasn't contacting me directly. Above all, I desperately wanted to know why he decided to call off the marriage. But this approach left no room to ask for his reasons or any other questions, only to accept the settlement offer. I had hoped for a chance to meet Andrew face to face, even for a minimal conversation. However, the moment he appointed a lawyer, I was faced with the reality that his heart had already distanced from us. He no longer wished to have any contact with me. No matter how hard it was to accept, I had to move forward with my children. With a heavy heart, I nodded to the lawyer's proposal through tears. Six months have passed since Andrew told me we had to part ways. 
my children and I have overcome the deep sorrow, and recently, our emotional wounds have started to heal gradually. Although our family dinners had become occasionally disjointed as the kids grew up, we have since made sure to dine together every night. These meal times have become moments to share our daily experiences and feelings. One evening during our family dinner, Isabella suddenly brought up recent events about Jennifer, as if remembering something important. Caught up in busyness and emotional turmoil, I realized I had completely forgotten about Jennifer's existence. Isabella mentioned that about a month ago, while she was returning from work, she found Jennifer waiting near the company where she works. At first, I thought mom had come all the way to my office. She looked similar, but her vibe was totally different, so I immediately felt that something was off. Then she said she's Jennifer, which surprised me. She mentioned she was doing well. I was puzzled about why Jennifer had gone to see her, which only added to the mystery. Actually, Aunt Jennifer came to my university too. I thought it was mom at first, but it was someone completely different. The fact that Jennifer appeared not just to Isabella, but also at Alexander's university was even more surprising. What could have been Jennifer's purpose in visiting them both? From Isabella and Alexander's accounts, it was clear that Jennifer had repeatedly suggested going out to eat together, inviting them over, and even proposed living together. I began to feel uneasy about Jennifer's odd behavior. Jennifer was already 38, and her actions might indicate some future plans. I wondered if Jennifer, remaining unmarried, was aiming to ensure she had children to care for her in the future. According to Isabella, Jennifer currently had a partner, but that didn't necessarily mean having children. A terrifying hypothesis that Jennifer might be trying to take my children away sprouted in my mind. Sensing my worried expression, Alexander reassured me with a calm look. Mom, don't worry. We'll always be your children. We won't become someone else's kids. While I was anxious about any potential future approaches from Jennifer, Alexander's words offered me some comfort. I reaffirmed my determination to protect Isabella and Alexander. Days later, Isabella rushed in from work with an envelope, eager to share something. Mom, look at this! I and Alexander carefully opened the envelope together. Inside appeared to be a wedding invitation. Holding the envelope, I wondered if I knew anyone who was getting married soon. But the moment we fully opened it and checked the contents, I and Alexander were struck speechless with shock. The invitation listed Jennifer and Andrew as the senders. Andrew and Jennifer are getting married? Alexander's words delivered an unbelievable shock to us. It was as if a bucket of cold water had been poured over our heads, helping to snap us back to reality. Gradually, I began to comprehend Jennifer's actions. Jennifer had always had a nature of wanting what I had. First, she took my house, then my children, and finally, my fiancé Andrew. Mom, I just can't forgive her! Isabella's voice was tearful, her anger and disappointment palpable. I can't believe it. This woman is like a devil. It was unusual for the typically gentle Alexander to show such anger. His face was filled with anger. Taking a deep breath to calm down, I decided to call Jennifer to confirm the situation. Jennifer answered the phone surprisingly quickly. Jennifer, we received your wedding invitation. Jennifer laughed happily over the phone, surprising me further. You got the invitation already? I was surprised, too. I didn't know Andrew was your former fiancé. My mom told me, and that's the first I heard of it. But by the time I met Andrew, you two had already broken up, so it doesn't concern me, right? Don't hold it against me. I couldn't believe her claim that she didn't know Andrew was my former fiancé. Considering Jennifer's actions, it seemed deliberate that she took Andrew from me. 
I understand why you would suspect me, but there's no proof I took your fiancé, is there? Maybe it's your fault you were left. You never care about your clothes or hair, and you don't wear makeup. Even if we look alike, it's obvious why Andrew chose me over you. You're not feminine enough, and that's why he left you. I'm sorry for you. Jennifer, laughing, added insult to injury before hanging up. A fierce anger rose within me after the call. I found it difficult to resist the urge to confront Jennifer and make her aware of the consequences of her actions. It was evident that Jennifer played a part in Andrew's sudden decision to call off our wedding. We were truly happy, believing our happiness would continue. But Jennifer took it all away from us. Clutching my smartphone, I trembled with rage, unable to contain my anger. Wrapped in deep silence, the air felt heavy around me, leaving me speechless. Having listened to Jennifer's talk through the speakerphone, both Isabella and Alexander were filled with anger. Before I could say anything, Isabella stepped forward with a calm yet firm stance. Mom, that wedding is in two months, right? I'll go in your place. It'll be okay, no matter what happens. Isabella's face was expressionless, but her eyes revealed strong will and determination. I'll go too. Not to celebrate, but it might be worth seeing. Isabella and Alexander exchanged looks, silently agreeing with each other. Though their voices were calm, the atmosphere conveyed their intense anger. Feeling angry at Jennifer's words, seeing my children's reaction helped me regain some composure. When Isabella and Alexander extended their hands towards me, I grasped them firmly. I could feel warmth and strength from their palms. Jennifer, whom I had met again after 20 years, had undergone an unimaginable transformation. The words my mother had said, she hasn't changed at all, now made clear sense to me. Jennifer has always taken away what was important to me. I felt I should teach Jennifer the most crucial lesson of her life. Constantly taking from others ultimately benefits oneself in no way, leaving one with nothing but loneliness. Jennifer deserved to fall into hell. Since deciding to attend the wedding, Isabella and Alexander seemed busy with some scheme. It was clear they were planning something, but they hadn't disclosed the specifics to me. Mom, just relax at home on the day of the wedding. Forget all your worries and enjoy your favorite cake. That's the best. Isabella said this with a warm, heartfelt smile. Mom, after everything settles down, I have something I want to discuss with you. Don't worry. It's not bad news, so look forward to it. I was slightly nervous about what they intended to discuss. Yet, seeing them enjoy their daily lives lightened my heart a bit. Suddenly, a call from my wedding planner friend came. Charlotte. Actually, last month, your sister came to our venue. And that groom, could it possibly be? Sensing my friend's hesitation, I decided to share the truth. Yes, that groom was once my fiancé. It seems my sister fell in love with him by chance. It's such an ironic fate for sisters to love the same man. Deep down, I had strong suspicions about Jennifer. However, not wanting to worry my friend unnecessarily, I ended up saying things that seemed to defend Jennifer. But my hidden feelings were quickly noticed by my friend. Charlotte, there's no need to force a smile when you're sad. You're always too hard on yourself. I'm always here for you, on your side. And then, my friend shared some very important information with me. Astonishingly, more than half a year ago, Jennifer had visited her wedding venue with Andrew for consultation. This was when Andrew and I hadn't yet broken up, and they seemed very close. Although my friend knew Andrew from before, he didn't remember her, so their visit didn't raise any suspicions. Hearing this deepened my suspicions about Jennifer and Andrew, turning them into conviction. 
Andrew's frequent business trips might have been cover-ups for meeting Jennifer. I told my friend that Isabella and Alexander had some big plans for the wedding day. I'm not satisfied with this situation either. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. Tell Isabella and Alexander. Despite my own struggles, I truly appreciated my friend's understanding and support. But I didn't want her to overextend herself. Just knowing she was on my side brought me great comfort. That night, I told Isabella and Alexander about my friend's offer to help. However, I may not know what you're planning, but you must promise me not to cause any trouble for my friend. That's a must. Isabella and Alexander understood my concerns and tried to ease my worries. Don't worry, Mom. We won't cause any trouble. We just need a little help from your friend. Isabella's words were bright, accompanied by a reassuring, gentle smile. It turns out the wedding between Jennifer and Andrew is going to be a relatively small ceremony. Even though Jennifer initially wanted a big ceremony, Andrew chose to invite just his closest friends and colleagues. Instead, his company colleagues and senior management will occupy many seats. For his parents, the situation is not one to rejoice over, and they're feeling complicated about it. Considering the groom's family, they've decided to attend at a minimum. However, that wasn't enough seats for the bride's side. Proud Jennifer had sent out invitations to many old friends, concerned about the ceremony's appearance. This detailed info was secretly shared by the friend, a wedding planner. Tomorrow is Jennifer and Andrew's wedding day. Isabella and Alexander seemed excited while choosing their outfits for the ceremony. Though the children assured me I didn't need to attend, my worry didn't easily fade. So, I arranged with the friend to enter the venue as staff, a plan unknown to my children, prepared to protect Isabella and Alexander if needed. The wedding starts at 11.30 a.m. By 10 a.m., I saw off Isabella and Alexander at the door, wishing them well. Don't worry today, Mom. We'll have fun stories to tell, so just relax at home. After they left, I quietly got ready and discreetly headed to the venue. Upon arrival, the venue was bustling with guests, including my parents and children. I entered through the back to avoid being noticed. Guided by the friend, I waited inconspicuously near the venue's back door, disguised enough to not be recognized by my family. So, it seemed that neither my parents nor my children noticed my presence. As I glanced through the door, I caught Andrew welcoming guests alongside his family, visibly taken aback by Isabella and Alexander showing up. Why are Isabella and Alexander here? Why? We were invited by Aunt Jennifer. The card came for Mom too, but obviously, she couldn't come. Hearing Alexander's reply, they entered the hall with smiles, leaving Andrew visibly puzzled. I felt they got what they deserved, but my children weren't done yet. Soon, the hall dimmed for the ceremony to begin. The newlyweds entered under the spotlight, Jennifer beaming happily but Andrew's expression seemed off. Looking more closely, Jennifer's wedding dress design seemed a bit too revealing for the venue's atmosphere. The design, with its exposed décolletage and boldly cut back, felt somewhat inappropriate for her age. Though such a youthful bride might have looked appealing, for Jennifer, it seemed a bit of a stretch. Nevertheless, the bride and groom confidently made their way to the main table, Meanwhile, through a hidden earpiece, I could hear Jennifer and Andrew's voices. Jennifer, why did you invite Charlotte's kids? And you sent an invitation to Charlotte too? What were you thinking? Isn't this going to cause problems? Andrew's voice whispered his anxieties to Jennifer. Thanks to the friend's arrangement, a mic hidden in a vase at the main table relayed their conversation to my earpiece. 
This arrangement was made in case any trouble arose so that we could respond swiftly. The bride and groom had presumably agreed to this in advance, but it seemed they had completely forgotten about that fact. What are you talking about? No one cares about such old news anymore. Plus, Charlotte's kids are part of my family. I wanted them to see our happy moment. Jennifer's words, free of regret, reignited my anger. But I chose to quietly watch how things would play out. The ceremony began with a speech from Andrew's boss, praising him. Then, his colleagues and close friends followed, creating a warm atmosphere with their commendations. As the speeches went on, the room began to feel a bit weary. Especially Jennifer, who clearly looked bored at the main table. As the fourth speaker wrapped up, the awaited moment for the toast arrived, bringing cheers. Isabella and Alexander watched quietly. True to Isabella's earlier declaration of not celebrating, they seemed to hold no festive feelings. I felt deep apprehension about what was to come. After the toast, as the banquet shifted to casual conversation, Andrew's colleagues began offering him drinks. In contrast, none of Jennifer's friends approached her, leaving her visibly disappointed. Why isn't anyone coming to me? As we reached the midpoint of the ceremony, the MC stood up again. Now, let's have a special blessing speech from the bride's friend. Following those words, a woman from the friend's table stepped forward to take the microphone. Looking at her, I felt a sense of deja vu. Recalling my memories, she was Jennifer's close friend from high school, who had visited our house several times. Jennifer, congratulations. We've been close since high school, always spending time together. Her speech started off with a smile on Jennifer's face beginning with pleasant anecdotes. However, as the content gradually shifted, the atmosphere in the venue began to tense. Initially bright with high school memories, the tone of her speech changed, and the audience started noticing. Jennifer always had an eye for what belonged to others. Back then, even the slightest bit of attention from you would completely turn my dear boyfriend into your admirer. As she continued, the surrounding friends showed a moment of surprise, then enjoyed the talk in a light-hearted manner. On the other hand, Jennifer's expression quickly turned to confusion and irritation. Why bring up such old stories? Really troublesome. She expressed her annoyance through bitter murmurs. Seeing another friend preparing to speak, Jennifer's expression became even more severe. This friend, too, began sharing past episodes with a hint of sarcasm in her words. Jennifer, congratulations. I was shocked. You always said, I'll definitely marry abroad, but here you are back home. You were always good at manipulating people with your charm. The venue's mood shifted again, and Jennifer's expression gradually darkened. Another friend began to deliver her speech. Remember how you bragged about enjoying an affair with a tutor in high school? It didn't make sense back then, but growing up, it became clear how you love taking what belongs to others. Congratulations on your wedding! Their speeches enveloped the venue in an awkward silence, and Andrew's family and colleagues looked bewildered. Seeing Jennifer's past actions, Andrew gazed at her with a mix of surprise and question. It's just an old joke. Don't be upset over such things from the past. Jennifer's attempts at justification lacked conviction. She, furious at her friend's speeches, glared at them with a demonic expression. After finishing their speeches, the friends seemed relieved and joyously engaged in the feast. Their faces radiated the freshness of having released something long held. In the midst of this atmosphere, the MC announced the next program. Next, we have a special video message from a friend who couldn't be here today. Jennifer's expression instantly changed to excitement. I wonder whose surprise it is. She mused happily, 
fixated on the screen. As the venue darkened and the screen lit up, it showed a flamboyant interior. There, men in flashy attire appeared, their presence unmistakably indicating they were men from a male review club. Thank you always, Jennifer. And congratulations on your marriage. Now you can come to play even more luxuriously with your husband's money. You're our number one. Celebrate even bigger at my next birthday event. Truly, congratulations. Yay! They cheered boisterously and then disappeared from the screen. Contrastingly, the venue fell into a chilling silence, casting a cold atmosphere. The attendees were astounded, at a loss for words. Through my earphones, I heard Andrew's mix of astonishment and confusion. What does this mean? Jennifer frequents male review clubs? He murmured, unable to grasp the reality. The people in the venue were shocked by this unexpected turn, speechless at the revelation. Andrew's voice, heavy with disbelief, reflected his own shock. The entire venue was stunned by the video, struggling to find words. Seeing Andrew's face flush with anger, I instantly knew his inner turmoil was a whirlwind of rage. Meanwhile, Jennifer couldn't hide her anxiety and disarray, sweating profusely. She looked around frantically, repeating her excuses. I don't know these people. There must be some mistake. There's no way such an impudent thing is acceptable. I'll have a word with the venue manager about this later. Jennifer insisted, her voice shaking in desperation. Breaking the tense air, the MC's voice resonated. Now, let's hear a speech from the bride's family representatives, Ms. Isabella Morris and Mr. Alexander Morris. At that announcement, Isabella and Alexander stood up from the silent venue and walked towards the central aisle to the microphone. I held my breath, listening intently to their words. I'm the bride's niece, Isabella. And this is my brother, Alexander. She introduced calmly yet confidently. Andrew and Jennifer, seated at the high table, watched them with enveloping tension. Continued in a composed tone. We're here as relatives of Aunt Jennifer, but truthfully, we don't have much of a connection with her. The person we truly owe is Andrew, the groom. Alexander's words turned Andrew's face even sterner, heightening the tension in the venue to its peak. As he continued, a video started playing on the wall at the back of the venue. It showed Andrew happily spending time with my children. There were scenes of celebrating Isabella's birthday and enjoyable fishing trips with Alexander. We were so happy back then. Overwhelmed by profound sadness, the video's final part displayed Andrew's heartfelt proposal to our family. Andrew was engaged to Aunt Jennifer's sister, our mother. When he proposed, he asked not just mom, but also us, her children, to become his family. We were truly happy about those words, overjoyed at the thought of becoming a family with our beloved Andrew. Tears streamed down as Isabella spoke, her voice quivering. After the divorce from our father 20 years ago, mom raised us alone. It wasn't easy for her. But meeting Andrew brought genuine happiness to her life, smiling every day. We wholeheartedly rejoiced, believing mom found her happiness in marrying Andrew. Andrew, weren't you happy with the time spent with mom? Could those two years be so easily forgotten? Was Jennifer truly that mesmerizing? Please, remember the joyous days we shared. The video in the background replayed those happy memories, touching the attendees. Jennifer watched Andrew with a complex expression, as if savoring something bitter. Andrew's face turned red with anger and confusion, overwhelmed by deep regret. I'm truly sorry, deeply sorry. Andrew, we can't celebrate today, but you did bring us happiness, however brief. 
For that, we are truly grateful. I watched, holding my breath. In that moment, Andrew's emotions overflowed. Unable to hold back his tears, he rushed from the head table toward them, his demeanor conveying a profound apology. Isabella, Alexander, I'm truly sorry. It was all my fault. Carried away by Jennifer's sweet words, I now see how foolish I've been. I promise, no more mistakes. Please, let's become a family again, live together, start over as a family. Andrew repeated these words tearfully, showing his profound remorse and regret. Seriously, you're kidding, right? You betrayed our mother and now you expect us to act like a family again? There's no way such a self-serving story is acceptable. Do you seriously think so? If so, that's just self-centered delusion. Do you understand how much your betrayal hurt our mother? Andrew, trust once broken isn't easily restored. You understand that basic fact as an adult, right? Sorry, but we will protect our mom and ensure her happiness. You should take responsibility and deal properly with Jennifer. And never show yourself to us again. Andrew's expression was filled with despair, unspeakable frustration hidden within. Isabella and Alexander's gaze was cold, looking at Andrew as if he was something displeasing. Then, an enraged Jennifer descended from the high table. What do you think you're doing? Get out of my wedding! Unforgivable! It's all lies! I did nothing wrong. This is defamation. Jennifer, actually, there's plenty of evidence of your affair with Andrew. While my mom and Andrew were engaged, you visited his office multiple times. All recorded by the security cameras at Andrew's company. One of Andrew's colleagues nodded in support, indicating his cooperation. A staff from the club in the entertainment district kindly helped us. He recorded you both entering that famous hotel next to the male review club. Interestingly, the date matches the period when my mom and Andrew were engaged. To me, Jennifer appeared as a wild beast, trembling with rage, eyes sparkling with anger. Isabella continuing firmly with her words. And you, Aunt Jennifer, you seduced our father, leading to their divorce, didn't you? A letter from my dad made everything clear. That affair you boasted about with a tutor was actually with our father, wasn't it? I was shocked by this revelation. Jennifer, who was then just a high school student, indeed turned out to be the other woman involved in the affair that led to the end of my marriage to my ex-husband William. Moreover, Jennifer, you've had troubles overseas with men, haven't you? My dad told us you returned to America as if fleeing from those troubles. This wasn't supposed to happen! As Jennifer furiously swung her arm, I instinctively moved to protect my children, absorbing her attack. Sis! Jennifer stood frozen, uttering in astonishment. Mom, were you here the whole time? Are you okay? Despite the pain, I managed a tender smile. Concerned, Alexander watched over me. Tears streamed down Andrew's face, wordless. Isabella, Alexander, thank you so much. I'm truly blessed to have you. My heart feels light and rejuvenated thanks to your courageous actions. I deeply appreciate them. Andrew's family seemed eager to say something, but many guests supported Isabella and Alexander's honest confession. Don't think this is over. I won't accept this. I'll fight this thoroughly. Regarding future proceedings, our lawyer will contact you. We will claim damages for this series of events and your actions 20 years ago. If you can't accept this, please hire a lawyer and respond. We are ready to fight and proceed with the necessary legal actions. 
I confronted Jennifer, clutching Isabella and Alexander's hands firmly, and feeling our unbreakable bond. Jennifer was shaking with anger but speechless. Let's go home. We don't need to be here anymore. I said, and we began to leave the venue. At that moment, Andrew's voice of agony reached us from behind. Charlotte, I'm truly sorry. What should I do? How can I make you forgive me? After a moment of thought, I turned back and addressed Andrew. Just as Alexander said, It's time for you to take responsibility and be with Jennifer. And disappear from our lives forever. That's the responsibility and obligation you have now. We exited the tumultuous venue with quiet steps, the almost lamenting tone of Andrew's voice faintly reaching us. But we did not heed it and continued firmly on our path. My heart was moving towards a new future with my beloved children, supported by our unbreakable bond. A month after the chaotic wedding, our days slowly started to return to their previous tranquility. Jennifer and Andrew's marriage didn't come to fruition. Andrew took our words to heart, but Jennifer rejected them, declaring, I'd rather live with dignity than bend to your will. Our parents severed ties with Jennifer, warning her never to set foot in their house again. I encountered difficulties with the compensation claim I filed against Jennifer. Her defense, which relied on the statute of limitations, proved invalid because the clock stops when the identity of the partner involved in the infidelity remains unknown. Recently revealed letters from William confirmed Jennifer's involvement, thus allowing the claim. Surprisingly, Jennifer paid a substantial compensation in one lump sum, likely as her final act of severance. No one knows of Jennifer's whereabouts afterward. Rumors suggest she might have gone abroad again, but the truth remains unknown. To us, Jennifer became a memory of the past, never to reappear. Overcoming past trials, we were ready to start anew, with a future free from shadows of the past. Letters of sincere apology from Andrew kept arriving, but whether I could fully forgive the past remained uncertain. I had no desire to see Andrew again, and deep down, I strongly felt that I couldn't contemplate marriage for a while. I never imagined William had been sending letters to my children all this time. The revelation that my ex-husband William had been secretly exchanging letters with my children for 20 years since our divorce was a huge surprise. Learning about a new aspect of William and Jennifer's past relationship while struggling to accept this fact. Swayed by Jennifer during his younger years, William initiated our divorce and fled overseas with her. Disenchanted with her true character, he returned to America in search of a new beginning. Isabella conveyed William's constant wish for my happiness. Dad was a bit shocked when he heard you found a new fiancé but wanted to send his congratulations. William's words brought warmth to my heart. Appreciative of William's confession amidst this ordeal and learning he had quietly yet steadfastly looked out for us, offering a renewed sense of hope. Mom, are you thinking of starting over with Dad? Is it possible for us to consider living together again? Alexander's unexpected question brought warmth and an involuntary smile. The conversation Alexander wanted to have before the wedding must have been concerning William. To Isabella and Alexander, William remains their beloved father, despite being my past husband. I'm not opposed to meeting and talking with him, especially if it brings even a little happiness to us. Mom, Dad's about to arrive. You can't wear jeans. Put on a nicer skirt and make sure to do your makeup. Following Isabella's advice, I changed into a skirt, unsure of the appropriate attire for meeting William again. Dad said the same thing, there's no point in trying to impress Charlotte now, while blushing shyly. Alexander's words filled my heart with warmth as I saw my own reflection blushing slightly in the mirror. 
The doorbell rang, and Isabella and Alexander headed to the entrance with hopeful expressions. I took a deep breath, paused for a moment, and slowly opened the front door. I can't understand why you, who should be protecting our home, recklessly spend the money I work so hard to earn. His face flushed from alcohol, he didn't hide his anger towards me as soon as he returned home. Actually, I bought this computer with my own savings. There's no way you could have that much money given you're currently unemployed. You're definitely lying. He accused me, condemning me outright. As I tried to calmly counter his anger, he raised his voice even more furiously. Mike, in a rage, pulled a document from his bag. Are you serious about this? He handed me official divorce papers, already half filled out. We're getting a divorce. I can't live with you anymore. I took the divorce papers and responded with a genuinely satisfied smile. Yes, I'll gladly accept. What did you say? My name is Emma. I'm currently 32 years old and have been married for four years. My husband Mike, a salesman, and I met at a typical mixer, nothing out of the ordinary. Quitting my job, which I had held for a long time, upon getting married, I started a new life. The reason I attended that mixer was a strong recommendation from a colleague, Sarah. Please. You've been a mentor to me since college, and I couldn't say no. Given those special circumstances, I'd be happy to join. At that time, I was focused on my career and not particularly interested in marriage, but since I couldn't find a clear reason to refuse, I agreed to participate. A man asked the participants. Everyone, if you were going on a date, where would you like to go? Hmm, I think the aquarium would be nice for me. Sarah's response was very cheerful. The mixer took place in a sophisticated restaurant with all the participating men dressed smartly in suits. Somehow, Sarah directed the flow of the conversation towards me. Emma, where would you like to go? After a moment of thought, I replied in a light tone. I think the amusement park would be nice. Being my first time at such a social event, I was unsure of how to behave properly. Feeling anxious, but trying to blend in, I spent the time smiling politely and adjusting to the atmosphere. As the event was drawing to a close and I was about to hurry home, one of the men stepped in front of me, stopping my path. Emma, the moment I first saw you, I was drawn to you from the bottom of my heart. Would you consider going out with me? This man would become my life partner. From the day we first met, he approached me directly, without hesitation. It felt like a scene from a movie or drama, and we exchanged contact information briefly before saying goodbye. I thought his interest would fade over time, but he consistently kept in touch, almost daily. Do you have time this weekend? I got some tickets to the aquarium from a colleague, and I thought you might enjoy it if you're up for it. If you're free for Christmas, how about we spend some special time together? I'll arrange for some champagne. The aquarium was a place Sarah enjoyed, and I already had plans to spend Christmas with my family. Despite that, his earnest invitation gradually won me over, and I ended up agreeing to spend time with him. What started as monthly meetings soon became weekly, as we saw each other more frequently. Working for a major company, he could be forceful at times, but his sincere expressions of love touched my heart, and I gradually opened up to him. About a year after we first met, we decided to commit to each other forever. And that day was my birthday, making it an unforgettable special day. Dressed in an elegant suit and with a smile full of confidence, he bravely proposed. Emma, will you marry me? Let's walk through life together. Moved by his sincere feelings, I embarked on married life with him. Our wedding, while not lavish, was a beautiful, heartwarming affair. Surrounded by family and friends, 
we received blessings and tears of joy. Our close friends, sometimes teasingly saying we're always so in love, genuinely wished us happiness. However, Sarah alone seemed unable to hide a worried look. Are you sure it's okay? When I first told her I was getting married, she reacted cautiously to my decision. Emma, I always think of you, so please come to me with any worries, anytime. Her warm encouragement gave me a bit of relief, and I was grateful she sensed my inexperienced anxieties about love. Life after marriage was fresh and filled with happiness, but transitioning to a housewife as suggested by my husband brought mixed feelings. I'm really not good at household chores and need your support in that area. I'll take full responsibility for supporting our finances. His earnest, albeit slightly apologetic, approach left me with several questions and concerns, but ultimately, I decided to accept his request. Deep love for him made me believe we could overcome any future challenges together, and I thought it prudent to prepare for a time when children might come, possibly requiring me to leave my job due to busyness. However, our peaceful and hopeful days were short-lived as my husband unexpectedly lost his job, presenting us with a significant challenge. Emma, I'm truly sorry. At work, a mistake made by my boss somehow got blamed on me. Moreover, the mistake involved a crucial business partner, and despite my repeated assertions of my innocence, they wouldn't accept it. I'm really sorry. Seeing him repeatedly apologize, choked up with emotion, all I could do was continue to support him. There's nothing to worry about or really, we're going to be okay. A new path will open up for us. Let's first take some time to rest and refresh both our minds and bodies, then we can take the next step forward. I offered words of encouragement. Although there was unemployment benefit, maintaining our previous standard of living felt precarious, and there was hesitation to dip into savings due to future uncertainties. During this time, while my husband was looking for a new job, I decided to secretly start working from home to support the household. This turning point came after a conversation with my best friend, Sarah. You should start working from home, Emma. That way, you can earn an income while still being at home. Sarah, already walking the freelance path, gave this valuable advice upon learning of my financial struggles. Leveraging my experience as a designer, I began to tackle small jobs in between household chores. Though the income was modest, a few thousand dollars a month, it became a significant support for us. Months passed, and one evening, my husband came home with an unprecedented joy radiating from his face. Emma, I finally found a new job. It's in sales again, and the workplace atmosphere is really good. Sure, the salary is lower than before, but don't worry. I'll work hard to get back to our previous income level. He reported with hope in his voice. The moment of relief from long-standing anxiety and tension made I tear up in front of my husband. Congratulations, truly. It's been tough, but finally, it's paid off. Let's continue to work together from here on out. I sincerely celebrated my husband's success, reflecting on the hardships we overcame together and sharing hope for the future. I'm deeply grateful. It's because you were there to support me that I could overcome this. We hugged each other, sharing the joy we both felt. Seeing him regain his confidence after starting the new job enveloped me in a great sense of relief. I had no doubt that their happy days were returning, almost a conviction. Actually, today, I had an important meeting with the president of Thrifresh Company. They really valued the experience I've accumulated and immediately entrusted me with a responsible role. He happily reported a smooth start at his new workplace. Every time he proudly shared work achievements or stories, I actively listened, nodding and reacting appropriately, sharing in his happiness. That's truly wonderful. Your hard work is bearing fruit. I offered words of praise and support to my husband. 
You get to enjoy your time at home, lucky you. He unexpectedly remarked. What? I responded, momentarily at a loss for words. Enjoying my time at home. Have you forgotten you're the one who asked me to be a stay-at-home wife? I don't think it's fair for you to say that. I countered my husband's unexpected remark. Don't be so upset. It's not like I said it with any bad intentions. Without sincerely apologizing, he made excuses in a casual tone. Despite feeling slightly hurt by this exchange, I convinced myself it was probably just the alcohol making him speak carelessly and decided not to take it too seriously. However, such inappropriate comments from my husband gradually became more frequent, revealing his growing dissatisfaction with me, fueled by the harsh working conditions at his current job. Long working hours and relatively few days off had increased compared to his previous job, and I realized that this stress was causing him to make unfair remarks. There was a time when I couldn't prepare dinner by the time my husband came home because I was out visiting my ill mother. Why isn't dinner ready? Aren't you supposed to be taking care of the home? I had to rush out because my mother was feeling unwell today. I'm really sorry. You could have managed your time better and prepared the meal in advance. I was worried about my mother and left in a hurry. It took me a while to get things done around the house after I got back. I'll plan better next time. You should be more efficient. You don't have a job, so managing your time should be something you can do. Get things ready quicker. I felt quite uncomfortable with his remarks. It was hard not to sense the malice in his words. In fact, I had messaged him earlier about the situation, but even that seemed to irritate him. You always speak from a high horse. I don't intend to, but... That can't be true. Don't forget that you're living off my earnings. A little gratitude wouldn't hurt. I never imagined that our mutual expressions of love could change so much. The transformation of his words of love into something so different was shocking and frustrating. Then consider all the housework you've left to me. You say you're clumsy and don't help out. You don't even thank me anymore. Housework is a woman's role. It's strange if you, being unemployed and at home, do nothing. He laughed as if he was mocking me. You criticize me for being unemployed, but I've been working from home. I emphasized. This home-based work was something I found while he was looking for a job change, and I continued it even after he started working again because it gave me a deep sense of satisfaction. However, when I later told my husband about this work, it seemed he didn't really understand what I was doing. Is that the thing you do on the computer, like answering some surveys for pocket money? That kind of thing is practically the same as being unemployed. It's completely different. What I'm doing is working as a professional designer, handling officially commissioned projects from companies. No matter how detailed I explained it to my husband, he wouldn't listen, refused to acknowledge my efforts, and just assumed I was exaggerating and denied everything. Arguing in such a situation felt like a waste of time, and I painfully realized that the man I once loved wholeheartedly was nowhere to be found anymore. When I discussed this situation over the phone with my friend Sarah, she reacted exactly as I thought she would. Emma, it's totally unfair for you to be treated like that. After all the support you've given him, to receive such a cold response is just unreasonable. It turned out just as I expected. But, Sarah, did you know about his personality from the beginning? Actually, after the mixer, he asked me out on a date. But he wasn't my type, so I gently turned him down. Then he insulted me, saying I had no taste at all. She shared the incident with me. That's really awful. I pressed her on why she didn't tell me about his condescending attitude sooner. Honestly, when I heard you were dating him, it really pained my heart. 
You seemed so happy, I struggled with whether I should say anything. But I thought maybe there was some unseen compatibility between you two, so I ended up saying nothing. You were so worried about me. That's why when we got married, I understood why you weren't completely happy for us. As time went on, my relationship with my husband began to deteriorate, and new problems emerged, starting with delayed credit card payments. Does this mean the payment wasn't made? My husband had two bank accounts, one for his salary and another for savings, and the usual credit card withdrawals were made from the salary account. This account also covered utilities and rent, but upon checking, there was hardly any money left, making it difficult to pay for the credit card and other expenses. There's a bill here, but it looks like there's hardly any money in the account. What's going on here? Have you been careless with money lately? I confronted my late returning husband about the bill issue. What? How I spend my money is my business. You're out of line for an unemployed person to say such things. You have no right to question me. He became enraged, interpreting my inquiry as an unjust criticism and showed strong anger even while intoxicated. That's why I'm telling you I'm not unemployed. But aside from that, what are you spending so much money on? You come home drunk every night, you must be killing time somewhere after work. Stop nagging. There are reasons for everything. He snapped back without genuinely apologizing, speaking in a dismissive tone. Watching him hastily walk away to the living room, I reached out to stop him, only to have my hand roughly pushed aside. Seeing his back, I felt any love I had for my husband disappear completely. By the next morning, I expected him to either ignore me or respond with contempt, giving no proper reply. From that day on, I avoided arguing with him and didn't complain, no matter how late he came home or how drunk he was. Whenever he ordered me around, I superficially showed compliance. Every time my guttered phrases like, you're just unemployed, or, I am superior, I just nodded and agreed, pretending to affirm his statements. Mike cared about appearances, so our troubled relationship was not exposed to neighbors or relatives. I also wanted to avoid letting others know about our deteriorating marriage, and somehow, it felt conveniently right. My parents were worried about my future, and I too wanted them to believe that everything was fine between my husband and me. After four years of marriage, I decided to get a new laptop. The old one I brought from my parents' house was outdated and slow, becoming a hindrance to my work from home. So, I splurged a little on a new, high-performance laptop and felt thrilled with its smooth operation. A week had passed since getting the new laptop. Working late into the night and after dinner, I was engrossed in my work at the living room table. As if to break the quiet time, my husband came home drunk and staggering, as usual. Hi, Mike. I paused my work and quietly closed the laptop lid to greet him as he arrived. Hey, is that a new laptop? I don't recall seeing it before. He showed a keen interest in the laptop I was using and questioned me about it. Yes, I bought a new one. The old laptop had become too slow and was affecting my work, so I had to. I explained why I got the new laptop. What? You spent my money on this without asking? What's the meaning of this? He expressed his anger vividly and punched the wall next to him. Perhaps he hoped to intimidate me with his actions. What are you thinking as a stay-at-home wife, wasting my earnings like this? Red-faced and possibly fueled by alcohol, he vented his anger. But, this laptop was paid for with my own savings. I didn't use your money for it. How could you, supposedly unemployed, manage to save up that much money? You must be lying. He showed skepticism and refused to believe my words. His disrespectful and presumptuous attitude deeply hurt me. 
Furthermore, he roughly threw his commuter bag on the floor and hurriedly took something out. Is this really what you want for our future? I asked as I realized he handed my divorce papers, which were already half filled out. We're getting a divorce. I can't live with you anymore. Who do you think you are, a stay-at-home wife? Yes, I welcome it with open arms. What? Are you serious? He was momentarily shaken by my unexpected response, unable to hide his confusion. Actually, I've been thinking about divorce for a while too. But I was worried about what my parents would think, and since my job isn't stable yet, I thought I'd wait and see how things go. But now that things have come to this, it's a relief that it'll save me the trouble. What are you talking about? You're the one who's going to be in trouble if we get divorced. Huh? The one in trouble would be you. You haven't forgotten that I've been working from home, have you? All you do is click around on the computer. At best, you're making just pocket money, so it's practically the same as being unemployed. How do you think you've been living up till now? That's obvious. It's thanks to me. You really don't understand your own income and how much you've been spending, do you? Then, I showed him the web page of the bank account for his salary account. As you can see, your take-home is $2,500, but the credit card withdrawals are up to $4,000. How can anyone live normally in this situation? It's obvious to anyone who looks. $4,000? Why is so much money being spent? Did you use it all on things like buying that computer? The card has always been under your control, hasn't it? I don't even know the card number, let alone have I used it. Then, someone must be misusing it. The cause of it all is your frequent visits to the hostess bars. That's far more plausible. How do you know about that? Sighing deeply, I laid out receipts and business cards from his favorite hostess bar in front of him. This business card, it's from a woman you frequently visit at the hostess bar, isn't it? Her name is quite charming. And looking at these receipts, you're spending $200 to $300 every visit. With that kind of money, you could enjoy a luxurious French dinner. Now I finally understand why you've been coming home drunk so late every night, it's because you've been spending your evenings at hostess bars. Why? How do you have those? I found them in the pocket of your suit. How could you forget that I take care of your suits every day? There's no way I could overlook such a thing. Well, that might be true, but… He hesitated but quickly returned to justifying himself. His brazenness was immeasurable. Even so, we've been living just fine up till now, haven't we? What does it have to do with you? Of course, it does. The utility bills, groceries, rent that you were struggling to pay, I've been covering them. Do you have any idea how much of a burden that's been? Huh? How could you possibly make those payments? It's all coming out of my earnings anyway. He dismissed my financial independence with his remark. I was appalled that he had no recognition of the savings I had built up before our marriage. There's no point in discussing this any further. I'll file the divorce papers. I'll pack my things by tomorrow and ensure I have nothing more to do with you. Please never interfere in my life again. Fine by me. Just get out of here already. If I don't have to see your face anymore, all the better. He said, laughing smugly. Honestly, that's my line. I've been thinking I should have left this place sooner before things got to this point. A classic case of too little, too late. Is that so? Don't come crawling back to me later, regretting your decision. And just so you know, don't expect anything from the division of assets. Without lending any more ear to my husband's words, I silently returned to my room to start packing.
Memories of our once happy newlywed life felt distant, and with a slight sense of regret, I accepted the reality that I no longer belonged here. When leaving the house, I departed without exchanging any words with my husband. I promptly submitted the divorce papers at the municipal office and made my way back to my parents' home. After explaining everything to my parents, I felt a moment of peace for the first time in a while, surrounded by the warmth of my family. A few weeks after the divorce, I received an unexpected call from Mike. Hey, what the hell is this all about? Oh. I completely forgot to set up call blocking. Goodbye, then. Wait, wait. You thief. Stealing my money, that's a crime. I couldn't help but snort in disbelief at his accusations. Stealing is out of the question. I haven't touched the savings account, and you've always been in control of the bank card. Then why are the rent and credit card payments behind? There's a pile of bills, and even the landlord is complaining. Really? You still don't get it? I'm amazed at your lack of comprehension no matter how many times I explain. What do you mean? He asked weakly. All I could feel was the pathetic state of my ex-husband and sighed deeply inside. I'll say it again. Did you forget? I've been working from home on design projects, and last year, I joined forces with my colleagues to start our own business as a corporation. A corporation? You mean to tell me you started a business? I had no idea you took such a bold step. When I told you I was leaving the dependent family members, I handed you the health insurance card. Despite that, it seems you hardly grasped our financial situation. So, how much are you making a year now? Roughly speaking, about $100,000. What? It's still a small company, but we plan to significantly expand the business in the future. I spoke of my ambitions for business expansion. Why didn't you tell me something so important beforehand? I did, but you never really listened, did you? All I got back from Mike were feeble excuses, and my anger only grew. How could you not notice something so crucial? You never showed the slightest interest in how your own life was being managed. Well, I've never really struggled with our lifestyle before, and I'm not good at financial management, so I left everything to you. Not only do you leave all the financial management to me, but how can you act so high and mighty about it? It's truly pathetic. Because I didn't know anything. You're going with that excuse? Listen closely. The reason you've been able to live without any inconvenience is that I've been diligently earning income and depositing it into the account for our household expenses. Conversely, most of the income you earned was spent on your entertainment and leisure. Now that you've heard this, do you finally grasp the full situation? Is this the first time you're actually understanding the facts? Wait a second. What am I supposed to do for a living from now on? What should you do? Maybe start by cutting back on unnecessary outings to hostess bars and seriously focus on your work? Emma, I was really wrong. I've been stressed from work and unconsciously took it out on you. I want to make a fresh start and redo our life together. Won't you reconsider? I've already made it clear that I never want to have anything to do with you again. So, from now on, you're on your own. Cutting off any attempt of his to retort, I immediately hung up the phone and promptly set it to block his calls. For me, spending any more time on someone like Mike was utterly wasteful. I quickly refocused on my work. After a while, I received an update on my ex-husband's situation through a senior acquaintance I met at a mixer, relayed by Sarah. According to the senior, my ex-husband desperately borrowed money from acquaintances without any intention of repaying, eventually leading many, including Sarah's senior, to cut ties with him. 
The push for divorce came as he plotted to marry a hostess he was infatuated with, but his affection was unrequited, and his proposal was immediately rejected. His wasteful habits continued unabated, ultimately leading to his bankruptcy under a mountain of debt. Often, I find myself reflecting on my ex-husband's downfall, and each time, I can't help but burst into laughter. One day, when Sarah and I met at a cafe for the first time in a while, she shared heartfelt words with me. I was relieved to hear you cut ties with him. But I wish I could have done more, and for that, I truly feel sorry. I'm sorry for worrying you. But you've always been concerned for me, and that's more than enough. During this, Sarah made a new proposition. Emma, listen. There's someone who's really taken a liking to you. Would you like to meet him? I can assure you, this time I highly recommend him. Sometime after the divorce, Sarah approached me with this suggestion. Sarah, who worked with me at my newly established design company, was a trustworthy friend and among the first I informed about my divorce. Sipping on an iced cafe latte, I appeared contemplative for a moment. To be honest, I think I want to take a break from marriage and relationships for a while. Especially, my trust in men has been completely shaken. Not all men are like that. Remember the client from the packaging design job we recently got? He's been captivated by your diligent work ethic and sophisticated design sense. Wouldn't it be too much of a pity to miss out on a wonderful encounter because of your ex-husband's influence? With no hesitation, I resolved to embrace and actively enjoy my fresh start. Oh, that's impossible. We live together after all. You just need to keep quiet and sign the divorce papers. Good luck with your newfound poverty life. Michael is a CEO. He can pay any amount in alimony. Saying so, Mia was smugly triumphant. Seeing this, the lawyer couldn't hold back and burst into laughter. Mia looked at the laughing lawyer with disbelief. The lawyer, wiping away tears of laughter with a handkerchief, said, the CEO is actually his wife. My name is Sarah. Michael and I have been married for two years. We don't have any children. Both of us work and are so busy that we often work on holidays. We hardly have time to talk and live a life of passing each other by. Instead, we take long vacations together, syncing our schedules for overseas trips, about once a year, which we both look forward to. When we got married, we decided to buy an upper floor apartment in a tower in the Bay Area. It was a stretch, but we took the plunge thinking about the future value of the property. Thanks to that decision, we are satisfied with our life now. I have a close friend from high school, Mia. We still go out for lunch occasionally. Mia has always been beautiful, with high standards for men. She hasn't married yet but seems to have a strong desire to. On dating apps, she always looks for men with high education and income, especially not compromising on income. One day, we enjoyed lunch at a cafe near the park. We were in the same class in both high school and college, and we've consulted each other on various matters. Thanks to that, we knew each other's taste in men. During our student days, we shared both the good times and the bad, always together. Now, it's a fond memory. But since marrying Michael, we've both become busy, and now we hardly meet a few times a year. Hey, can I come visit your apartment sometime? Suddenly, Mia asked me this. Mia had never come to visit the apartment before. So, I invited Mia over to the apartment for the weekend. Even through the intercom at the entrance, I could tell Mia was amazed. Wow. Mia kept saying this. As soon as I opened the door, Mia looked impressed. This place is incredible. And the elevator ride up was so long. 
I had decided to splurge on a spacious upper floor apartment as a once in a lifetime purchase. It's even bigger than a house. It's beautiful and truly amazing. Mia was carefully checking out the inside of the house. The location is great, and being on a high floor of a tower building with this layout must have been quite expensive, right? Mia asked, clearly fishing for information. Yes, it's what you'd call a million dollar apartment. The security is top notch too. Look, over here. Cutting me off after hearing the phrase, million dollar apartment, Mia said. Right, it must be over a million. Your husband must be earning a lot. Mia seemed really surprised. I thought to myself that it was such a typical reaction of Mia, always setting high standards for men, especially regarding money. Michael's salary might be considered high for his age. I said vaguely, as I'm not fond of speaking bluntly. Hmm. Seemingly not quite satisfied, Mia said. Can I use your bathroom? And then she left the living room. After telling Mia where the bathroom was, I started preparing tea in the kitchen. Getting worried about Mia not coming back from the bathroom, I was about to go check when she returned. Sorry, I was replying to an email. Mia usually doesn't make excuses like this. I felt a slight sense of discomfort towards Mia. While we were eating cookies she brought as a gift and having tea. Can I stay till tonight? Mia asked. She seemed to want to greet my husband, Michael. Indeed, since we haven't seen Michael since our wedding, wanting to meet him isn't odd. So, I checked with Michael just in case. Michael happily agreed, saying. Looks like I'll be able to get off work early. So, I told Mia. That's fine. And started preparing for dinner. During that time, Mia was on her phone, but when I noticed, Mia was nowhere to be seen. Mia didn't come back for quite some time, and when she finally did, she was wearing a necklace that looked familiar to me. I realized it was my necklace as I looked at it closely. How does it look? Do I look good? Mia posed like a model. Seeing my stunned expression, Mia started laughing. Oh come on, it was just a joke. I found it by chance. It's really cute, isn't it? Plus, it must have been really expensive, right? It was pricey to begin with, and now it's even more valuable because it's a limited edition, right? Mia was chattering away like a child trying to justify doing something wrong. That was a gift from Michael. Wow, that's amazing. He must be really wealthy to be able to afford this. Mia sighed. More importantly, that necklace was stored in the closet of the bedroom. So, Mia had gone into the bedroom on her own and peeked inside the closet. It was an action I found hard to believe. But criticizing her for it felt somewhat petty, so I just emphasized how important the item was. Can I borrow this necklace for a little while? Is that okay? I was at a loss for words when I heard that. I'm meeting a doctor I got to know through a dating app, and I want to wear it then. Please? Mia pleaded with her hands together, so feeling bad to refuse, I reluctantly agreed to lend it to her. Okay, but please take good care of it. As I said earlier, it's a gift from Michael. Hearing my words, Mia was stroking the necklace with a smile. Of course. I understand. It seemed like my words didn't really register with her, but after I finished some prep work for the meal, I pretended to go to the bathroom and went to check the bedroom. As expected, the closet in the bedroom and the chest by the bed were not properly closed. Mia must have opened every drawer and door she could find. Fingerprints were clearly visible on the jewelry, watches, and precious metals. Mia touched them but didn't seem to borrow anything. The shoes were deformed as if she had forcibly tried them on. 
This was definitely going too far. So, I went back to the living room to talk to her about it. Mia, you touched various things in the bedroom, didn't you? The shoes were deformed, and there were fingerprints on the watch. Instead of apologizing, Mia puffed out her cheeks a little. I'd like you to stop doing that from now on. Sorry. I didn't want to strain our friendship over something like this, so I decided to laugh it off lightly. Just then, Michael came home. He was holding a box of cake. Michael and Mia saw each other for the first time since our wedding, and although it was awkward at first, they gradually warmed up to each other, leading to a lively dinner. By the time we were eating the cake Michael had brought, the two of them were chatting like good friends. While I was washing the dishes, they were laughing together. Exactly. Isn't my boss the worst? I'm so jealous of the people who work under you, Michael. Hearing this, Michael smiled wryly. Not at all. <laughs> I noticed Mia casually touching Michael, which bothered me, but I wondered if it was better than being distant. After all, Michael isn't interested in Mia. However, about a month after Mia's visit, Michael's behavior started to change. He began to hold his phone more than he used to. Even when I was talking to him, he would be distracted and ask me to repeat myself often. The phone was always with him, even in the bathroom or shower. It was a clear change, and I quickly realized I had become the cheated on wife. I thought about checking Michael's phone once, but it was difficult because he always had it with him. Gradually, Michael and I stopped talking, and his weekend work increased. Even though we were already living passing lives on weekdays, the increase in weekend work made it feel like we were living separately within the same house. Exhausted, we decided to sleep in separate bedrooms. I thought this might lead to divorce or separation. One day, I found divorce papers on the living room table, already signed by Michael. Although I was prepared, seeing it in reality shook me. With trembling hands, I called Michael. I just got home and saw the divorce papers on the table. What's this about? It means exactly what it says. I want a divorce. I wanted a solid reason, so I pressed for one. According to Michael, he's fallen in love with someone else. Not just a fling, but genuinely in love. What is he talking about? It's obviously an affair. Then, I heard a familiar voice on the phone. It was Mia's voice. I had suspected it, so I wasn't too shocked. I'm dating Michael. And I want to marry him. Knowing it was one thing, but being confronted with the fact made my heart race and sweat break out. When I met Michael at your house, it was love at first sight for me. So, we exchanged contacts and started messaging, and things just developed from there. Mia's manner of speaking became increasingly vulgar. This must be Mia's true nature. Michael says he has nothing more to say to you. So, can you just sign the divorce papers and submit them? I want to talk to Michael once. Please tell him to come home. What? That's impossible. He's living with me now. You just need to sign the divorce papers and submit them. Good luck with your upcoming poor life. With the phone call abruptly ended, I stood frozen for a while. I couldn't sleep for a while and Michael didn't come home. The divorce papers remained untouched on the living room table. Moreover, Mia sent me several photos of her and Michael together. She seemed to be flaunting their closeness, enjoying it. Were they that close? I became mentally unwell, my complexion turned pale, and I started to look vacant even during the day. People around me became concerned and suggested I go to the hospital. I was practically forced to see a doctor and started taking medication, which helped me sleep and regain some calm. I managed to go back to work somehow. 
But then, an unbelievable incident occurred. When I returned from the hospital, something felt off in the apartment. When I checked the closet in the bedroom, bags and jewelry were missing. The number of watches in the chest didn't add up. There could only be one person behind this. Why would she do such a thing? What have I done to deserve this? I became unable to sleep again, wandering through my days in a daze. When I discussed the theft at my home during counseling at the hospital, I was strongly advised to consult a lawyer. So, I immediately made an appointment with the company's lawyer. What would you like to do? I'll get a divorce. And I want those two to face proper consequences. I was surprised by my own decisiveness. Just a little while ago, I was agonizing over what to do, yet now my response came so naturally. Maybe deep down, I always wanted to retaliate against them. After all, they had caused me so much unilateral suffering. Now, it was my turn to fight back. A week later, Mia contacted me. It was because I had sent a formal notice to her workplace. Hey! Why are you sending a formal notice to my office? Mia was furious. I could hear the anger in her voice. You must have been prepared for at least this much, right? Anyway, I've left everything to my lawyer now. I hung up the phone after saying that. Mia called several times, but I ignored all her calls. Then, Michael called. I had sent a formal notice to his parents' house, so the affair had been exposed, causing a major uproar there. I wanted to laugh at the poetic justice, but restrained myself. Just leaving things to the lawyer didn't seem enough to settle my feelings, so I decided to meet them in person. To deliver a thorough retribution. The lawyer arranged for a meeting at the law firm. A few days later, they reluctantly showed up at the law firm's office. I had expected them to bring their own lawyer, but they came alone. Mia burst through the door brusquely, with Michael awkwardly trailing behind her. Finally, we meet, you coward! As Mia shouted in a rage, Michael tried to stop her. Because she's been running away. Our wedding keeps getting delayed because of it. Mia seemed ready to throw her bag at any moment, with Michael desperately trying to calm her down. Watching them with a cold gaze, the lawyer quietly intervened. Please calm down. If any violence or verbal abuse occurs, we will immediately call the police. Is that understood? At the mention of the police, Mia tensed up. Regaining some composure after the lawyer's intervention, Mia and Michael took their seats. Facing each other across the office table, the discussion finally began. So, Michael, you're seeking a divorce, correct? Mia was defiant even as the conversation started, while Michael slouched, looking diminished. We agree to the divorce. However, considering the affair, we will be claiming alimony. Any objections? Michael's expression darkened. I'm fine with the divorce. Just pay the alimony and then never contact me again. I nodded quietly. Mia looked displeased, perhaps expecting me to put up more of a fight. As the lawyer started discussing the amount of alimony, Mia snapped back. I told you, any amount is fine. I have plenty of money. Mia said this arrogantly, arms crossed. The lawyer sighed deeply, looking at Mia. What, you didn't check? Michael is the president of a jewelry company worth billions of dollars. As Mia boasted, Michael frantically tried to restrain her. Ignoring whether it mattered, Mia continued, face flushed with excitement. Alimony for an affair is nothing to me. I'll even give you a fair share of the assets. Michael tried in vain to stop her, but she shrugged him off. Your salary barely covers living expenses, right? Mia said, laughing. 
The lawyer burst into laughter upon hearing this. Mia looked confused, not understanding why the lawyer was laughing. My apologies for laughing. It's just... Mia, the company president is actually Sarah. What? Mia was taken aback, her mouth agape in surprise. Meanwhile, Michael slumped beside her, trembling. Michael is just an employee without any position in the company. I am Sarah's company's consulting lawyer. Then, Mia started laughing hysterically. What are you talking about? Are you really a lawyer? Is it okay for lawyers to lie? If you find it hard to believe, why don't you ask Michael right here? Michael was looking down, biting his lip. Seeing this, Mia, possibly feeling anxious, grabbed Michael's arms and shook him, asking. You said you were the president of a jewelry company worth billions, right? What's the truth? Michael didn't answer. He covered his face with his hands, emitting an inarticulate groan. Even Mia seemed to realize the truth all of a sudden and started to panic. Hey, answer me. You're not lying, right? Then, in a quiet voice, Michael murmured. Sorry. That single word echoed in the silent room. With Michael's apology, Mia was plunged into despair. That's a lie. You can't be the president. She pointed at me as she said that. Why didn't I know about this? After all we've talked about. Just because we're best friends doesn't mean I share everything. Especially with you, since you're so obsessed with money, I never intended to tell you. I looked directly at Mia, without averting my eyes, as I spoke. Mia seemed to lose all her strength and sat down on the spot. Then, that house? Of course, it's in my name. So, Michael will be the one leaving. Mia fell silent, and Michael remained with his head in his hands. That's why Michael didn't want to come here. Coming here meant that all the truth would be laid bare. Hell if he came, hell if he didn't. There was nothing but hell waiting for Michael now. The lawyer then began to reveal the documents I had brought. First, this photo. It shows Michael and Mia together. This was a printed version of the photo sent to my smartphone. The lawyer placed an IC recorder on the table and played a recorded conversation. Why would you send something like this? I just wanted to share a bit of our happiness with you. Hearing Mia's voice, Michael appeared to be holding back tears. Still clinging to the past? I want this divorce to happen soon. I know what you're holding on to, Michael's salary, right? Because he's the president of a jewelry company worth billions? You're hiding that fact because you thought I'd take it from you? So, just get divorced and move out of that tower mansion already. It will be mine soon. Michael won't be coming back to you, unfortunately. I'll pay whatever alimony you want. Your target wasn't Michael, it was the money. I'm appalled that Michael couldn't see that. Michael was looking down, possibly with tears staining his pants. Both Michael and Mia eventually fell silent. Do you think it's over? What else is there to say? Mia, you broke into the house while Sarah was away and stole various items, didn't you? The lawyer spoke calmly, surprising Michael, who seemed unaware. What? Stealing? What are you talking about? I didn't do it. I know nothing about this. The lawyer pulled out a tablet, placed it on the desk, and played a video. It showed Mia sneaking into the bedroom, taking bags and jewelry, and stuffing them into her purse. What is this? Why were you filming this? Isn't this invasion of privacy? The house has always had surveillance cameras. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Why would I need to say something? I wouldn't think you'd steal. 
This foolish exchange gave me a headache. And you used my keys without permission? I wanted them. It's your fault for not buying them for me. They began arguing, ignoring us. Watching them, both the lawyer and I were astonished. Please save your arguments for later. Regarding the theft, we will be filing a police report. The police? That's an exaggeration. I was just borrowing a friend's stuff. I never said you could borrow anything. I countered. Moreover, we're not friends or anything. You were just a classmate. So, I will be filing a police report. Realizing her defeat, Mia's demeanor changed drastically from her previously confident stance. Don't say that. I'll compensate for it. I promise to pay back everything. Just please, no police. Mia began to prostrate herself. Really? You'll compensate? The items you stole are worth far more than your annual salary. Can you afford it? Mia was speechless at my words. Plus, there's the matter of alimony. Mia, turning to Michael with tears in her eyes, pleaded. Hey, you'll pay for it, right? Even if you're not the president, you earn enough, don't you? Michael remained silent. He can't pay. I'm firing him. Hearing this, Michael looked up. Indeed. Michael has not been coming to work since leaving the house. Plus, with this scandal, we've received complaints from his superiors. Michael looked like he might collapse on the floor at any moment. But, there's the division of assets, right? I'll pay with that. There will be no division of assets. Sarah and Michael had a prenuptial agreement. Michael didn't tell you anything, did he? He never shared anything inconvenient with you. I looked at Michael with contempt as the lawyer placed the contract on the table. The agreement states that if the marriage lasts less than three years, neither party will seek a division of assets. Currently, it's been two years. Mia grabbed the paper, attempting to tear it up. That document is a notarized deed. It's best if you handle it carefully. Damaging it could lead to legal consequences. The word legal consequences stopped Mia's hands. Michael, you have savings, right? Use that to compensate. Do you think I have such money? You always wanted steak, this and that. There's no way I have any savings. It seems so. And there are debts from not so reputable sources as well. Mia slumped her shoulders, a pitiable sight. This wasn't supposed to happen. What are we going to do now? I left the rest to the lawyer and stood up. Mia, money isn't something you steal from others. It's something you earn through effort. After that, the divorce was successfully finalized. Michael's belongings were sent back to his parents' house. Michael's parents kept apologizing to me and even sent a letter of apology. Mia was interrogated for illegal entry and theft after I filed a police report, and she was arrested after admitting to her crimes. Half of the stolen items had already been sold, and only the remainder was returned to me. Despite the crime's severity, it seemed she might get a suspended sentence for showing remorse. However, it was discovered she had also stolen from men she met on a dating app, leading to a prison sentence for Mia. Mia's excessive reaction to the police and the word a crime was because of this. Michael couldn't stay in Mia's apartment and moved to an old apartment in the suburbs. He's been job hunting but has struggled to find employment due to being fired from his previous job for absenteeism and poor work attitude. So, he's been getting by on day labor. I receive regular updates about their situation from the lawyer. After the divorce, I've thrown myself into my work, expanding my homemade jewelry sales to Europe. 
This opportunity came about after taking a long vacation to Europe, where I met the owner of a French jewelry shop. We shared a bottle of wine, and I passionately discussed my jewelry designs. The owner and I hit it off, and he agreed to stock my company's jewelry. He's a wonderful person who understands my pain, possibly because of his own divorce history. Honestly, I'm focusing on expanding sales in France because I want to see him. It might be mixing personal with professional, but I think I deserve this much. After all, I've been through so much. I'm home. Why are you coming home at this hour? I wasn't feeling well. Is she your girlfriend? Shut up. We were just about to have some fun. You're in the way, so after you make dinner, don't come back until night. He is my husband's son, Tom, a 25-year-old stepson who still lives at home despite his age. Perhaps because it's his family home, he doesn't like my presence and is often harsh to me. I came back because I wasn't feeling well, you don't have to say things like that. You're just like a maid, don't get cocky. Dad said you're convenient. You bring in money and take care of the house. I am Sarah, a 40-year-old working in sales at a small to medium-sized company. Being unmarried at my age, I might be considered with issues by some, but I've enjoyed my life in my way. Indeed, compared to my married friends, I live a freer life. I've seen friends who seem happy living with their families and children, but they also struggle financially due to childcare costs. And having a family doesn't mean they can skip daily meals and housework without stress. Though I've lived a life far from the warmth and happiness of a family, I've been able to travel to hot springs and spend money on what I want to do. I dislike the term expiration date, especially since there is an age by which women are expected not to be able to marry or have children. Men, as they age, tend to have more financial freedom. And what's sought in men who want to marry is financial stability. However, even if the man has financial stability, it doesn't necessarily make his partner more attractive as a marriage partner. I've understood this from a young age. I used to intend to stay single for life, but turning 40 made me think about spending my old age alone, bringing various anxieties. Hearing from superiors and colleagues about their grandchildren has only accelerated these thoughts. My daughter had a baby, and when I met him for the first time recently, I felt the same awe as when I had my children. Your grandchild? That's nice. Raising my daughter was so hard, I thought I never wanted kids. But holding my grandchild made me feel like I wanted to raise him in her stead. It's like a motherly instinct kicked in. It's not uncommon to have grandchildren by the age of 50. Hearing such stories makes me think these people will have a warm family to surround them in their old age. My parents have passed away, and I have no family, so there's no one to be by my side in the end. Such thoughts make me feel incredibly lonely, especially when I'm drinking alone at home. That's when I met George, the president of a company I visited for work. As I was assigned a new client, I made an effort to get along with the client, as building a strong trust relationship is crucial in sales. Knowing this, aim to deepen personal connections before introducing the company's products, and I found we got along better than expected. I went camping with my son for the first time in a while. It took us three hours to get there by car, but it was worth it. I used to go camping a lot when I was younger. Yes, it's very fun. Absolutely. I actually love visiting different camping places too. Sharing a hobby of camping, I found myself enjoying the conversation with George, putting aside my sales pitch. We hit it off right away. We were able to deepen our friendship and successfully sign a contract. Our professional relationship has continued since then, and about six months after we met, he invited me out to dinner. It didn't take long for us to start dating. 
Both of us were busy with our careers, but we had both reached a certain level of experience and were at a midpoint in our lives. So, we didn't fight over the small stuff and our relationship smoothly continued for a year until one day. So, I have something important to talk about today. I've mentioned before that I wanted our relationship to be with the intention of marriage, and I want you to have this. This is for me? He said this and pulled out a small box from his suit pocket. Inside was a slim pink gold ring. I was being proposed to. I had dated a few people before, but I never wanted to get married, so those relationships ended, and I had never been proposed to before. Even though I had become somewhat jaded about things as I passed 40, I never imagined I could be moved to tears like this. I hardly ever cried in front of people, having lived a career on my own, and perhaps my pride was higher than others. Being seen by him in tears was truly embarrassing, but the joy overwhelmed that feeling. I took the ring, tears streaming down my face and my hands trembling. At that moment, the tension on his face relaxed, and he gently held my hand. Having decided to live alone from a young age, I never thought I would get married. Nor did I imagine that being proposed to would make me this happy. Part of this happiness was surely because it meant I no longer had to worry about being alone in my old age. My marriage is what you might call a mature one, quite different from the marriages of people in their early 30s. So, about the future, I'd like you to meet my son first. And I want us to have a proper talk. Right. Now that we're getting married, we should definitely do things properly. But he's already 25, so I don't think he'll be too upset. Because he's 25, I think there might be some resistance to us living together. Wait. Live together? Are we going to live as a threesome from now on? I knew he had a son from his previous marriage, which ended because his wife ran off with someone else. Since then, he's been raising his son alone as a single father. I was aware his son was 25 and pursuing his dream of becoming a musician while living as a freelancer, but I hadn't realized they were living together. When he proposed, I was thrilled, partly because I thought I wouldn't need to have much to do with his son. It's not that I don't want to get along, but I imagine it's tough for a 25-year-old, and suddenly living with a stranger must be unwelcome. The joy I felt at the proposal has vanished, replaced by anxiety about starting this new life. We're scheduled to meet his son and have dinner together a week from this discussion. That week, I was so preoccupied with the meeting that I could hardly focus on work. What if his son opposes our marriage? What will George decide? I know it's pointless to worry alone, but I couldn't help it. The night before our dinner, I could barely sleep, resulting in significant sleep deprivation the following day. Trying to calm my racing heart, I went to the cafe where George and his son were already seated. After taking a deep breath, I entered, and George waved at me. I smiled at him and nodded slightly to his son as I approached. Nice to meet you. This is Sarah, whom I'm going to marry. Say hello. Hey. Hey. If a new hire I was mentoring greeted a client like that, I'd be furious. You'd expect a proper greeting to your father's fiancé. Though I had these thoughts, I kept smiling and took my seat. Feeling he might not have a good impression of me made my heart race even more. Luckily, the waiter came over to take our order, which helped me calm down a bit. I ordered an iced coffee and gave George a look, signaling him to take the lead. We've decided to get married and want to start living together as soon as possible. We plan to use the available room, so I hope you two can get along. Wait, live together? Isn't George capable of reading the room and making judgments based on people's reactions? Anyone could see that improving our relationship should be the priority. It's obvious to anyone that our first meeting is awkward. Bringing up living together all of a sudden, 
What kind of reaction was he expecting? While internally sighing, I tried my best to keep smiling, not letting my concerns show on my face. Looking at his son, I began to explain as if to justify the situation. We don't have to start living together right away. I think it would be nice to have dinner together a few times and get to know each other first, so don't worry. I'm not planning on getting closer anyway. I figure you'll just use the spare room we have, and if you're in the way, I'll just go out. Don't bother trying to accommodate me. Right. Once the moving preparations are ready, the three of us will start living together, so let's all get along. George really doesn't seem to get it. It feels like he's throwing his hands up, as if it's not his problem and we should just handle it ourselves. But when I think about it, living at home at 25 probably isn't great either. Maybe it's not such a big issue after all. Telling myself this, the dinner meeting came to an end. We moved in before my work got too busy, and the three of us started our new life together. As expected, I hardly ever saw George's son, and it felt like just the two of us were living together. About a week later, his son began to appear in front of me as if nothing was amiss. You haven't made dinner yet? Sorry. I just got home. What? Useless. Excuse me? Never mind. Useless? First of all, how dare he speak to someone older? It might be seen as old-fashioned, but there's a way to treat your elders. Besides, I work, so meals can't just appear whenever he wants. Yet, George, who spoiled his son even at 25, is likely to side with him, not me. Unable to divorce, I decided to accept what I could and try my best to adjust. Sorry, I'm late today because of a meeting. How are you two getting along? Well, today he got mad at me for not making dinner. But I'll try to get along better. Dinner? You didn't make it? Well, I got home late from work. That's a problem. He can't make meals himself. You know my company's performance is getting worse and we're running low on money, right? I don't want him to spend too much. So I'm to be blamed? A father should scold his son for such rude behavior, not excuse it. But considering he's coddled a 25-year-old dreamer and freeloader, perhaps this is to be expected. Despite my worries and concerns about our future, I didn't expect him to freeload forever. Eventually, he'd become a full-time employee and stand on his own. Holding on to that hope, a year went by. I'm home. What? Why are you home at this time? Who's this? Sort of my dad's lover. Well, to me, she's more like a maid. Dad says she's convenient because she earns money, does chores, and even takes care of his needs at night. What? I had come home early due to feeling unwell, but I didn't expect to find my stepson bringing a young woman home when he was supposed to be at his part-time job. I'm not saying bringing someone home is bad, he's not a child and can do as he likes, but whether he was just putting on a brave face or being sincere, the heartless words left me stunned. What do you mean? What are you saying? I was looking forward to some fun time, and you're just getting in the way. You're just a maid here, so could you just make my dinner and then leave? That's not the point. Surely, you can't talk to me like that? You do realize who is providing for this household, don't you? Doesn't it embarrass you to be acting this way at 26? I had been telling myself it was just a matter of enduring until he could stand on his own two feet. But his overbearing attitude was indeed a source of stress, and I had reached my limit with his thoughtless words. Normally, he wouldn't speak to me like this, but probably felt emboldened in front of his girlfriend. I thought I could overlook a lot being an adult, but there's a line, and he had crossed it. 
It's because you're loafing around as a freeder at your age that you don't know how to behave properly around people. Look, I'm going to inherit my dad's company and become the president, so I don't need to work like you. I have no business being lectured by someone like you, who married into money aiming for my father's wealth. Are you serious with those words? You're getting worked up over nothing. Dad doesn't see you as anything more than a convenient person, and it's the same for me. Can you stop wasting my time now? As he smirked, he said those words to me. At that moment, something snapped inside me. I had planned to stay quiet if I was speaking the truth, but it was clear there was no saving him. If what George thought was true, then there was no reason for me to stay in this house. I didn't want to spend a lonely old age by myself. That's why I had decided to marry, but if I was going to be exploited for the rest of my life in this household, I'd rather die alone. It's about time he learned who's been enabling his freeder lifestyle. With that thought, I decided to leave the house. As I began packing my things, the sight of my stepson laughing and heading to his room with his girlfriend infuriated me, but I suppressed my anger and headed to a business hotel. And that night. Hello. Thank goodness. I was worried you wouldn't answer the phone. What do you want? What do I want? Stop talking to me like I'm a stranger. But more importantly, aren't you coming back? Haven't you heard anything from your beloved son? It seems you see me as nothing more than a maid, so I've decided to live on my own from now on. What? No, that's not. So you're not denying it, which means you really thought of me that way, right? Your panic says it all, doesn't it? But his genuine panic in response to my words revealed the truth in his son's claims. At that moment, I was profoundly relieved we didn't have children together. Among my married friends, many who had been cheated on couldn't leave because of their kids. I wasn't cheated on, but the betrayal by the person I trusted most felt just as devastating. Knowing he truly saw me in such a demeaning way, I had no regrets about leaving. I refused to support you all any longer as a convenient maid. Wait a minute. It's troubling if you suddenly say things like that. It seems your son doesn't understand who's been enabling his lifestyle, but you do, right? You know who's been supporting the company's operation, including paying for our current rent and living expenses, don't you? Even over the phone, my voice must have sounded angry. Struck to the core, he fell silent. Since our marriage, his company's performance has been on a decline, and I've been covering almost all our rent and living expenses for about half a year. The company has been in the red every day, barely existing thanks to contracts I secured before our marriage. I thought it might be better to just shut the company down, but he insisted on keeping it going, hoping to pass it on to his son someday, so I reluctantly supported it. To think I've been bad-mouthed despite all the support I've given. There's no need to go this far anymore. Normally, you'd think he'd be grateful to me. If he was just using me from the start, then I've been thoroughly duped. Having worked in sales for years and being successful at it, I thought I had a good judge of character. Even helping with hiring, I might have been skilled in business, but clearly, I lacked judgment in personal matters. If you were only using me, then I'll make my decisions based on the merits and demerits too. There's no benefit for me to continue living with you or to keep supporting the company any longer. No, no, that was just my stupid son talking nonsense. The company has nothing to do with this. It's too late for excuses now. And tell your son that mocking me for marrying up, it turns out his own father is far more foolish. You might want to tell him to start job hunting soon because the company is going under. You are you serious? Unlike you, I've never lied to anyone. After being berated by me, he finally seemed to grasp his situation as his voice began to shake. 
George was always poor at understanding others' feelings, but even he must realize how angry I am now. I'd like my time, conscience, and money back if possible. I've dedicated my time for the sake of family. Thinking this, I felt the urge to throw my smartphone on the floor, but there's no point in losing my temper with such people. There's so much more I want to say, and ideally, I'd say it to their faces, but what I need to do now is cut ties with them as soon as possible. I'll send the divorce papers later, please sign them. Also, please start paying your own rent and living expenses. As for the company contract, it was never profitable anyway, and we were told to cut it off from above, so that's what I'll do. Please, think it over again. That stuff my son said wasn't entirely false, but it was just men fooling around. I wouldn't have married you if I didn't love you. So, are you saying that you still love me? Of course. You are the most important person in the world to me. If I'm the most important person in the world to you, you'll listen to my wish for us to take some distance, right? If he truly loved me, he would prioritize my happiness. But the moment I said that, he fell silent. It's as if he only ever thought of using me. I've moved beyond anger to sheer disbelief. Having said what I wanted to say, I hung up the phone. Perhaps realizing he couldn't let things end this way, my husband called me repeatedly. Annoyed, I turned off my smartphone and put it in my bag. I felt a sense of closure and fell asleep with ease. The next day, I went about my work as usual and began the process of terminating the business dealings with my husband's company. During that process, I thought about how much I had pleaded with my boss and the trouble I went through to keep the deal going. Knowing nothing of people's efforts or feelings. I felt murderous towards my husband, but knowing it would all end today somehow calmed me. Amidst the busy life of sending the divorce papers and other tasks, I received a call from my stepson. I wondered if he would lash out, ask me to come back, or perhaps apologize. Being 26 and having never contributed financially, just a grown child, he probably only now realized who had been supporting the household. But no matter what he said, I had no intention of helping him anymore. With that thought, I answered the phone. What do you want? I didn't realize you were the one supporting our lifestyle. I'm sorry. An apology now doesn't make me feel anything. Can you come back home, mom? Mom? Really? Enough with taking me for granted. I never intended to become his mother. Nor did I ever consider myself part of the family. I could usually keep my patience when we lived together, but this time I couldn't contain my anger. Stop mocking me. Who do you think you are calling mom? Don't get ahead of yourself. I couldn't care less what becomes of your life. You're struggling because you've never worked a proper job at 26. That's all on you. No, that's... Don't ever contact me again. I happened to answer the phone during my lunch break in the cafeteria, and my yelling made everyone around me stare in shock. That moment made me regain my composure, and I apologized to the people around me. Despite that, I felt a sense of relief inside. So, I refreshed my spirits and enjoyed my meal with a clear mind. The divorce papers, however, were not filed for a while, and after consulting with my boss, I was referred to the company's consulting lawyer. With the lawyer's help, the divorce was finally settled, and I was able to completely cut ties. Three months later, I was contacted by someone who used to handle transactions for my ex-husband's company, saying they were looking for work due to the company's bankruptcy and were interested in an interview. This person was very competent, so I immediately arranged for an interview with HR. I learned that my ex-husband's company had been struggling with layoffs, and he had been working night after night, putting in overtime. No matter how much they cut labor costs, the revenue didn't increase, 
leading to the company's inevitable bankruptcy. With a significant amount of company debt left, my ex-husband and his son were reportedly living in severe poverty. Rumor among former employees had it that they were living in a shared bathroom apartment. As for me, I've been enjoying a fulfilling single life while continuing to excel at my job. Having been married once, I've no current plans to marry again, living a happy single life doesn't seem so bad. Whatever my future holds, whether I marry again or remain single, I intend to enjoy my life to the fullest.